So the topic for today is going to be the Cook-Levin theorem, uh, the proof that uh, SAT is NP-complete, one of the, maybe the cornerstones of computational complexity theory. And before that, I will, you know, have some, some short discussions of, uh, of NP-completeness uh, and uh, the notion of reductions, although I hope that you are familiar with these concepts, because I would like to get down into sort of the guts of the Cook uh, proof of the Cook-Levin theorem as quickly as possible. Okay, so let us begin. <clears throat> so recall that, you know, last time we, we discussed uh, the important concepts of P and NP. So let me zoom this in. And so P was essentially polynomial time or you know, languages that can be decided in polynomial time. So it's deciding, deciding in polynomial time. And NP is what we called verifying in polynomial time. <clears throat> and, you know, P is a subset of NP, that is, if you can decide in polynomial time, then you can verify in polynomial time. And the big, I guess at this point, million dollar question or even more, the big question, the central question arguably in computational complexity theory is, uh, is, is P equal to NP? So what this means is, if language L can be verified <clears throat> in polynomial time. Can L be decided in polynomial time? So <clears throat> most you know, people who work on this uh, or who work in complexity or most theoretical computer scientists will probably think that the answer is, they believe that the answer is no. Verification seems like a significantly more difficult task than deciding, right? <clears throat> Verification is much more, is, uh, just because something can be verified doesn't mean that it can, it can be decided. And of course, the evidence for the for NP has been through the discovery of many, many problems that are NP complete. Uh, many problems where people have struggled to find a polynomial time algorithm. They have often discovered that it, the problem is NP complete. And the theory of NP completeness is one of the ways in which one argues about the hardness of problems. And so before we get into that, <clears throat> let's first talk about non-determinism. And I want to emphasize that while typically definitions of NP are through non-determinism, non -determinism, that is NP is called non-deterministic polynomial time, I think that the verification perspective is much more meaningful to have. Okay, so let us define first what a non-deterministic Turing machine is. So a non-deterministic, a non-deterministic Turing machine has a non-deterministic transition function. Non-deterministic transition function. <clears throat> where where you, you when we think of remember when we have a Turing machine, we think of the Turing machine having a particular state and reading some symbol here. So when we have, uh, I'll say, the state space, interest, um, Cartesian product with sigma, and for convenience, it's just going to be, I'm just going to imagine that this blank symbol is outside of sigma. So sigma is really the alphabet and blank is something separate. And this is just, uh, it's just a matter of convenience. So the deterministic transition function given a state 
and a symbol will tell you what is the new state, what is the symbol to write, and whether to go left or right. A non-deterministic transition function is over the power set, right? So it can basically make choices on where to go across, um, you know, left or right, right? So the non-deterministic uh, the Turing machine has choices. And so the running time, so conventionally we will say the running time is an upper bound, upper bound on all computational paths. Now this is important because in some sense, a non-deterministic Turing machine accepts if some computational path accepts, but the running time is an upper bound on all computational paths. Okay, uh, and given that, we can now say that L is in non-deterministic time of T of n <clears throat> if there exists a standard non-deterministic Turing machine, which I will write as NTM and a constant C such that M decides L and runs in C T N at most C T N time. Now note that there is a, <clears throat> if we go back to our definitions of verification, you'll see that there is a clear analogy between verification and non-determinism. So let's have the verifier perspective, the verification, the verification definition of NP. So what it says is, if X is in the language, then there exists a certificate. I'm not going to put in all the details. So certificate Y of polynomial size, such that M X Y accepts. And if X is not an L, then for all certificates Y, M X Y rejects. Now, if you think of non-determinism, non-determinism, the NP notion of non-determinism, you'll see that if X is an L, there exists a computational path, there exists a computational path where MX accepts, and if X is not an L, then for all computational paths, for all computational paths, MX rejects. So if you see the quantifier, there exists, there exists, and in the not case, it's a for all and a for all, because you're negating the condition. Is this clear? Any questions about this? Any questions? Good. So what this basically means is that these two views are essentially equivalent. The verification perspective thinks of there being a certificate and a Turing machine is just deterministic, whereas the non-deterministic view folds the certificate into the running of the Turing machine. So just as a quick question, so what is the verification stand? Okay. so. If you had a non-deterministic Turing machine and you wanted to look at it from a verification perspective, what is the certificate? Does my question make sense? So what is the certificate if you wanted to think of a non-deterministic Turing machine from a verification standpoint? The path. Uh, the path, you mean the computation? Well, you could just like write down which choice led to the accepting state at every step and that would be like polynomial size yes so it is exactly the computational path so the computational path is the certificate 
So the certificate could simply be the list of non-deterministic choices to make. And conversely, if you had a certificate viewpoint, you could make a non-deterministic machine which would guess the certificate non-deterministically, would simply guess what the certificate is and then verify it and then run it, right? So hopefully you see that these are equivalent viewpoints, non-determinism and verification. And in general, verification is more convenient from, I, I think of it from a semantic standpoint, that this, is, this makes more sense with respect to problems, when we want to think about problems. Non-determinism is more convenient when you want to write proofs. I mean, in general, okay? <clears throat> We defined NP in terms of verification, but you can also define it in terms of non-determinism. So I'm not going to explicitly prove this, but I think hopefully it is fairly uh, obvious by the previous discussion is that NP is just the union of, uh, I'll say K in N of non-deterministic time, N to the K. Now, the reason I say this is a claim and not a definition is because we defined NP in terms of verification and we, you know, and so this is essentially, it's making, it's making an explicit claim. Okay. <clears throat> any, any questions about, about this? Sorry. Hello. Did someone speak up? Can you hear me? A little louder. Uh, so uh, I just yeah, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to understand why uh, the verification thing is not as useful for writing proofs because it seems like in both cases you just have to show something exists. So why is the non-deterministic one more useful? So for uh, you, you will see that in the proof of the Cook-Levin theorem. Okay. So as I prove the Cook-Levin theorem, you'll see that taking a non-deterministic standpoint is actually quite convenient for that proof. But this holds for arbitrary uh, membership uh, questions. I mean, okay, so maybe what I made was sort of maybe was too bold a claim. I mean, you know, because they're equivalent, any proof written in one way can be written in terms of the other, right? They're equivalent. But on the other hand, um, it's just. You know, sometimes it is convenient to have a machine level view of what is going on, that you can manipulate a machine. And so in that case, you have a non-deterministic machine and you can manipulate it in certain ways. Like if you wanted to argue things like the non-deterministic time hierarchy, then it's kind of convenient to use the machine itself. So, so yeah, so I mean, I think that these are, it's okay. So let me put it this way. There are equivalent views of looking at the same definition and one of the things that appears a lot in computational complexity theory is having as many different views is useful because sometimes proofs become easier to see from one view and the other, even though they're all equivalent. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully the proof of the Cook-Levin theorem will, will answer that. Okay. So <clears throat> let's now talk a little bit about reductions or I should say efficient reductions and NP completeness. Okay, so let us recall, this is like a classic definition of reductions. A reduction from a language L to L prime is a computable is a computable mapping or function from strings to strings right such that if x is an l f of x is an l prime and if x is not an L, then f of x is not an L prime. This is specifically refer referred to as a carp reduction. This is called a carp reduction. It's also called a many one reduction. 
There are other notions of reductions known as Turing reductions. Okay, so just the, the picture that one should have in mind is think of this as the universe of all strings, each of these blobs. And I'm going to divide this into, I think of this, the set here is L. I think of this set here as L prime, set of strings. What is often also used is to call this a yes instance and a no instance. This string is in the language and this string is not in the language. And strings in this region are in L and the strings that are over here are not in L prime, L prime. So a reduction maps the shaded region to the shaded region and the unshaded region to the unshaded region. So if you look at what the reduction does, it maps these into subsets. Note that this doesn't have to be a bijection. It simply maps the yes instances to the yes instances, and the no instances to the no instances. So a reduction is efficient if F can be computed in polynomial time. This is what it was classically known. Now people have come up with various other notions of efficiency. So we might just instead say it's poly time, right? So reduction is poly time. If something can be done, this is denoted as L less than equal to poly N L prime. This is the notation that we use for this. So this is what is called an efficient reduction. Okay. And so computing reductions and understanding reductions of problems is sort of the bread and butter of computational complexity theory. So I'm going to pause here for just a minute. I want to take a few pauses in this lecture, make sure that you understand this definition. Uh, and, and then we'll continue. So I'm putting this definition up there. I'm going to just step outside for a minute and I will be back and then take any questions you have about this. Sorry. Okay, so um, I said this was a notion of a reduction. Does anyone know of any other notion of a reduction? Um, Sesh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I don't exactly have another notion, but I have a question. So in algorithms, I remember that oftentimes we uh, produce something to another in mm -hmm. order to solve that other problem for which we have an algorithm and convert it back yes and find a solution to our and following on that converting back um how does a many to one uh reduction come into play like when do we actually have a use for a many to one reduction because the one that i'm talking about i think it requires a bijection or at least like maybe one to many and many to one back but if that makes sense. No, so the way you think about this is the question is only deciding. It's not computing a function. Although, you know, so to think of the, the question here is given a string, is it a yes instance or a no instance? Mm -hmm. And so the way that you would compute that is you would say, suppose I could determine, suppose there was, suppose L prime could be decided. Mm -hmm. Then I can use the reduction to decide L because I would use the reduction and then use my decider for L prime. And I'm guaranteed that the answer is correct. I see. So let me, let me give you two pictures. And this is actually the, um, 
So raise your hand if you're familiar with the notion of a Turing reduction. Okay, so then this would be useful. So, <clears throat> okay, let's look at this. Let's look at this picture here. Suppose M prime decides L prime and we want a machine M that decides L. So what the many one reduction gives us is the following M. So here's the M that we can construct. What we would do is we're given X, we first apply the reduction. The reduction is denoted as F. So I compute F, I get F of X, and then I can feed f of x to m prime, and then this gives me yes or no. Now this box, m, is a valid box to decide l, because the reduction works. And this is what you get, this is the carp reduction, the carp or the many one reduction. Maybe you come up with a different algorithm. So your different algorithm might do the following. You're given x, and so you have this box m prime here. And maybe you use it multiple times. So you, you run it once, you get some output, then you run it again, so on and so forth. And then you finally use that to decide yes or no. This is referred to as a Turing reduction. It's a much weaker notion. So think of in a card reduction, you are allowed to use M prime exactly once. In a Turing reduction, you can use M prime multiple times. So that is the distinction. So you can look at the equivalence between functions with respect to card productions or Turing reductions, but it turns out that you know we have the theory of NP completeness is based on card productions. But you could also do things with respect to Turing productions. Okay. How does using it multiple times get you anything? It's potentially useful. It could be the case that maybe there exists. So, okay, let's just say, for example, suppose you had a machine that solves clique. So M prime solves clique. Maybe there exists an algorithm to solve Hamiltonian path that uses the clique algorithm multiple times versus there being an algorithm that only uses it once. Now you might say with respect to polynomial time, I don't care, all of this gives me polynomial time. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted a more refined understanding, then they are different. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions here? So I want to say something over here with respect to, so somebody asked, are bijective reductions I guess you you know you 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 may be able to do some kind uh are they possible I don't know I guess um maybe although it's not clear that a bijective reduction gives you more power like why would it be more convenient um yeah it's uh, I I don't I don't know if there's a specific utility for having bijective reductions Although, you know, I sh um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. But I don't, I don't, as far as I know, I don't think there's any utility, at least with respect to computation, where you have things like that. Um, oh, it gives you inverse mappings, right? So you would, I guess what that means is, well, you would only get inverse mappings if the function, if the inverse of the function was itself computable, or was itself, you know, um, was it efficiently computable. So in that case, you know, maybe you could get, if you had a function f such that f and f inverse were both polynomial time computable, then you basically get an equivalence between those functions. But in general with NP completeness, we'll see that everything is essentially equivalent. So I guess um, it's not that important. Okay, so I, um, <clears throat> so let's just, you know, look at this and, and, and a, quick comment is suppose 
L, I'm sorry, uh, reduces, so I'll just say in polynomial time to L prime, and L prime is in P. So if L prime can be decided efficiently, then L is also in P. Okay, so why, let me just sketch the argument out. So let's just look at this box M that we constructed here. So the running time, sorry, uh, the running time of M is, so let's say L runs in P, so there exists M, uh, I'm sorry, so I'm gonna start here. M prime, let's say runs in N to the D time, and the F computing the reduction, F computation can be done in N to the C time. So the running time of M, N is N to the C, this is to compute F plus the time to compute M prime, and this is going to be N to the C to the power D, right? Because N to the C, this is now the size of F of X. And this is now the running of M of M prime on F of X, right? And the point is this is still polynomial. The running time now is still polynomial. So this is where the closure of polynomials plays a role. When you chain reductions, everything stays polynomial because the size of what you compute stays polynomial. This is really important. So does this, does this make sense? This is still polynomial in N. Okay, questions about that? Okay. Now let's let's look at the opposite perspective here. So we said if L reduces to L prime, the, 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 the term reduction can actually be a little confusing. So, and if L prime is in P, then L is in P. Now let's say suppose L reduces to L prime, and the following situation holds, deciding L efficiently, which is the question, is L in P, is a long-standing open problem. Suppose. And I want to decide L prime efficiently. Then what do I learn from the fact that L reduces to L prime? The qu okay. Question makes sense? Could you repeat it? Okay. So let me let me actually do something here. So uh, I'm just going to I'm actually going to type something up shortly. And hopefully this will be clear. Uh, sorry, okay. So I'm just gonna create this poll. Okay, and I'm gonna launch the poll and then we'll see if, okay, so I'm gonna launch a poll. So here's, okay, so suppose deciding L efficiently is a longstanding open problem. So I think that this is gonna be very, very difficult to determine. But what I want to do is I wanna decide L prime efficiently. So L prime is some other language. And I prove 
that L reduces to L prime. So I prove this. Now, now my question is, which of these three options makes sense? So first is, I have proof that L prime cannot be decided efficiently. It's option A. B is, I should give up trying to decide L efficiently. And C is, I have learned nothing about L prime. So I should continue working on this. But this meaning I want to decide L efficient. This is what I want to do. Instead, I end up proving that L reduces to L prime. Now deciding L prime efficiently is a long-standing open problem. Which of these options, I'm sorry, let me move this up. Which of these options makes sense? So A is I actually have proof that L prime cannot be decided efficiently. B is I should give up trying to decide L efficiently even though I don't have a proof. And C is actually I've learned nothing about L prime so I should just continue to work. Okay. Think carefully before you answer. It's very important that you understand what happens here because this is the essence of NP completeness. Okay, so the answers are actually uh, somewhat all around. So some people, so there's one person who thinks it's A, some people think it's B, some people think it's C. And at this point, everybody has answered. Okay, so someone tell me why they answered what they did. Anyone want to justify their answer? Say their answer and justify it. I said B. You said B, okay. And I guess I think it's like if you had an efficient algorithm for if you could come up with an efficient algorithm for L prime, then you could use the reduction and that would be an efficient algorithm for L. And probably someone smarter than you would have thought of that earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, somebody raised their hand. Uh, I forget whom. Uh, no, that was me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I have a similar argument for B okay. in the sense that sure <clears throat> the reduction may shed some new light on L that may help solve it and if but given in a similar way like if it's been a long-standing problem people have tried to reduce it to change the form of the problem and solve it uh, and therefore um, it's very improbable that I have uh, you have come up with a reduction that actually solves a very long standing problem. So exactly. It's possible, so, but... Yeah. So that's why you give up. You don't have proof. You don't have proof. This is not proof, but this is evidence. This is evidence that this is a really hard problem. And indeed, this is exactly what NP completeness says. And okay. So this, I mean, this was the big insight and this was huge because for the first time there's actually a way of arguing that it's unlikely that something can be decided efficiently. One is you prove it. 
well, then fine. But then, you know, if you can't prove it and you're stuck, at least you get evidence from some other long-standing open problem. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I, I think the, the, the joke is that when you ask a computer scientist, you know, how do you solve something, the, basically they'll tell you, go and ask someone else. And that's sort of like, the equivalent here is, you don't know how to decide L efficiently, you don't know how to decide L prime efficiently, but what you recognize is that one leads to the other, and this gives you evidence. And so NP completeness is basically just taking this concept forward, so let me define L, um, well, I should say L. The language L is NP complete if L is an NP and for all languages in NP, M reduces to L. And if it's only two, then we say L is NP hard. So what this basically says is this is the hardest problem in NP. It's the hardest problem because if you can decide L efficiently, then you can decide all of NP efficiently. Right, this is sort of taking this concept on steroids, right? Instead of saying one language, you say the entire class can be done efficiently. So when you show that a problem is NP complete, you essentially show that if you could decide L, then verification and deciding are the same thing. So this gives, you know, there's the natural lemma here, which is the key to NP completeness, is that if L is NP complete, or even hard for that matter, is L is NP hard, and L is in P, then P is equal to NP. Right, basically because if L is decidable efficiently, then any language in NP can be decided efficiently. Okay? Is there, yeah. is there any proof that any problem can't be computed efficiently? Yes, the, there do exist languages that are not in N, uh, sorry, that are not in P. Okay. Explicit languages, there exist explicit languages that are not in P and this is proven using something called the time hierarchy theorem. Ah, okay. So, and you know, you, you can construct languages that are not NP, of course, we don't know how to construct such a language in NP, mm -hmm. right? Because then we would show that P is not equal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but essentially, and I can tell you like uh, languages that are exp complete, that are complete for exponential time are actually not NP. But we, we, we'll show that, we'll go okay. through that actually. Yeah. Cool. Okay, uh, any questions about this? Any questions about this? Okay, good. Now you might say, this seems like such a strange, it seems like such a strong property to hold that for all languages in NP, it should be reducible to this one language. Like does such a language even exist? It's a natural question. And it turns out there's actually a very simple syntactic way of coming up with an NP complete language. So, Here's a very strange, strange seeming language. So this is the language of, okay, so this is the language. So by when I use these angular brackets, I mean the encoding off. So M is a Turing machine, X is an input to feed in the Turing machine, and one to the T is just one is unary, is like a unary encoding of T. And so the language is M is a non-deterministic Turing machine that runs in T steps and 
accepts X. So this is a language of machines and strings with a time constraint. Okay? So firstly, you should be able to see that L is an NP. Because you're running a non-deterministic Turing machine. It's like a, basically, you do a simulation. This is using a simulation. As we discussed in the last lecture, you can simulate a Turing machine. So it's like running a universal Turing machine on this non-deterministic Turing machine and then making the non-deterministic choices. But as an exercise, what you can show is that for all languages in NP, M reduces to L. Indeed, L is NP complete. Any questions about that? Okay, so this is an exercise. You can see, you can actually see the reduction is quite simple. Basically, what you do is, given any language in NP, there exists a non-deterministic non polynomial time curing machine that decides it. So given that, you can essentially syntactically, you can construct the string. And this is in L if and only if the original, um, if the original string was accepted. So this language is NP complete. But this is such a clunky language. And what we would like is nice NP complete languages. Now the second utility of NP complete languages is, so here's another claim. If L is NP complete, and L reduces in polynomial time to L prime, and say L is NP complete, and L prime is an NP, then this means that L prime is NP complete. So if L is NP complete, and you have a language in NP, if you can reduce L to L prime, then L prime is NP complete. This is exactly, I want to, put this point out there. Remember that we discussed if I have deciding L efficiently is a long-standing open problem, and I reduce it to L prime, then I can give up working on L prime. It's the same logic here, which says that this is now formalized, that if L is NP complete, and I can reduce L to some other language in NP, then L prime is also NP complete. Indeed, the NP complete languages all have reductions to each other. And that's why an NP complete problem is useful because now you come up with your new optimization problem, L prime. And if you can show a reduction from an existing NP complete problem, then you know that your problem is also NP complete. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? So this is because like polynomials are closed under composition and exactly. just like- Precisely. It's the closure, this is, yeah, exactly. This is the closure of polynomials under composition. Okay, so this is a good time to pause. I've introduced NP completeness. Hopefully I've ex explained its utility. So let's pause for a couple minutes. And then when we come back, we'll talk about a specific NP complete problem called satisfiability. And we'll do the cook Levin theorem. And sorry, so I, I have to, I will be stepping out for just a second. So if there are any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And in a minute, I will go ahead and respond to those questions.
All right. Now um, that we've discussed NP completeness, let's now move on to a specific problem that we're shown to be NP complete. So this is the Cook Levin theorem. So this is a theorem of Cook in 71 and Levin in 72. They both independently proved that SAT is NP complete. Okay, so what is SAT? So a Boolean formula is uh, an expression with Boolean variables you know, x1, x2, xn, and the operators, operators, the negation operator not, and the binary operators and uh, or and and. And so your formula looks something like x1 or not x3 or x5. Um, you know, maybe an expression like this uh, and um, not of x5 or x10 and so on and so forth. You know, it could be any mixture of and, ors, and whatnot. And, and these, um, typically you can apply De Morgan's law. And when you apply De Morgan's law, you can assume that the negation is always associated with a single variable. And so you get quantities of this form. These are called, so these xi or xi, these are called literals. They are the literals of this formula. And we say phi is satisfiable if there exists a setting of the variables making the formula true. written as a language. So SAT is the language of all encodings of formulas such that phi is satisfiable. Okay, so SAT is the language of satisfiable formulas. So SAT is sort of obviously an NP because it says that what is the certificate? The certificate is the satisfying assignment. So SAT is an NP, right? So that is fairly easy to show. It's sort of obvious. You basically plug in, you plug in your assignment and you can check. The important observation, so the proof of the Cook-Levin theorem Okay, so we just argued, we argued that SAT is an NP. So the certificate, the certificate is the satisfying assignment. So the certificate is a satisfying assignment. What we will prove is that for all languages in NP, M can be reduced in polynomial time to SAT. Okay? We're going to show that for any language in NP, we can reduce the language to SAT. What does this mean? It means that given... So, okay, so... We will describe describe a polytime 
computable function that maps strings to Boolean formulas. So I'm going to think of my function f. I mean, it's from strings to strings. But I'll think of it as mapping strings to the set of encodings of Boolean formulas. Now, the property we will have is that x is going to be an m if and only if I'll call this uh, f of x is satisfiable. Remember, f of x is some formula. Okay? And the construction of f is going to be somewhat long and complicated. But you'll see that, you know, once we write it down, the proof by itself is not very difficult. So depending on how much time we have, I might not get into the specific nitty gritty details of all the proofs, but hopefully it should be clear to you. So let's sort of begin by saying, okay, so suppose M is an NP. What do we know? We know that there is an NTM, that is a non-deterministic Turing machine M and a standard. So standard non-deterministic Turing machine M that decides the language script M and runs in at most n to the c steps. So c is some constant. The proof uses something called the Tableau method. So there's a really important notion that comes up a lot in computational complexity theory. And we, we will see this notion appear repeatedly in proofs, especially as we do space complexity, is the notion of the configuration string. So what does the configuration string say? That at any time, in the running of M on some input X. Take the snapshot of so first is the state Second is the position of the head. The third is the content of the tape. And we will write this as a string. So note that the state has constant number of choices. The position of the head is going to be at most n to the c. So n is the size of our input x. The content of the tape, that's at most n to the c. So what we can do is we can construct a string. And this is the configuration string. The string is going to, so let me write this out. Sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma k, q, sigma k plus 1, to sigma L, where L is at most n to the C. So this is the content of the tape. So consider the string. This is the content of the tape. Q is the, the state. And we can think of the state, basically the is pointing to the head. So this is the position of the head. So you write down the state just before the position of the head. And you interpret the string as Essentially, essentially the entire state, I shouldn't even say state, the entire configuration of the Turing machine. What is important is that 
computation is just the evolution of configuration strings. Right, so essentially computation is all about how the string evolves over time. So in each operation, this, this configuration string is going to change and that change is computation. That change is computation. All right? So any questions about what the configuration string is? Okay. Now consider what is called the tableau. Okay, so the tableau is a matrix where each row is a configuration string. So what this means is the tableau looks something like this. The length is at most n to the c, which is at most the running time, which is at most the space that is ever used. The sort of the number of rows is at most n to the c. This is at most the runtime. So this is the running time. And think of this as the space. But both the space and the running time are bounded by n to the c. And so think of this represents t equals 0, t equals 1, so on and so forth. And this would be the time being n to the c. This is the time. Now let, so I'm, I'm going to use... Um, Okay, so sorry, let me just sort of state this carefully. Okay, so I'm going to use a variable, I'm just going to call it y, but y t k be a variable in sigma union q union space, right? So this is just saying that the characters in the configuration string are basically the state and, you know, uh, the, the tape alphabet. So YTK is a variable. This represents, this is the symbol at the kth position of the tth configuration string okay now here here's here's the key we'll say x is in the language if and only if there is a setting of the tableau such that the first configuration is the input x on the tape and uh, like the and the start state two is the last configuration is accepting what this means is that the state is an accept state. For convenience, let us assume that whenever the Turing machine reaches an accepting state, it's just going to continuously stay, it's just going to stay there. The, the configuration does not change. And third is each configuration 
is a valid configuration string. What this means is that only one symbol is a state. Right? You can only have one state symbol in the configuration string. So if you look at the configuration string, there's only one state. Everything else is a tape symbol. And fourth, each intermediate configuration follows from the previous configuration using a valid transition of M, of the non-deterministic Turing machine. Okay? Does this make sense? So I'm just, it's almost like syntactic. I'm saying that for X to be in the language, you need to have a computational path that accepts. And this encodes the computational path. It starts at the tape. It starts at the right input. It ends at the accepting state. Each configuration is a valid configuration, everything in the middle. So condition one is about the first row. Condition two is about the last row. Condition three is about each individual row. And condition four is about the transition from one row to the next row. So these are just some set of local conditions that you have to check. And indeed, this is why, you know, in Aurora Barak, it says that The Cook-Levin theorem is simply saying that computation is a sequence of local checks. And when you do these checks, you end up with, you know, you can basically represent computation and we can encode all of these checks in terms of a Boolean formula. Okay, any, any questions about this? Any questions about this? Okay, all right. <clears throat> and so let me sort of break it down a little bit more. So let's break down what each of one, two, three, and four mean in terms of the symbol, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of YTK. Okay, so let's just write this in terms of YTK. So in condition one, so I'm going to refer to this as start. So I'll say that X, so Y zero zero is the initial state. And um, Y zero K, K plus one is the Kth input symbol. This is of X. Assuming my indexing starts from, well, actually, no, let, let, let's just say indexing starts from one. So I can just do Y zero K. Okay. Let's keep it simple. So this is just saying that the initial has to be the initial start state and X on the tape. That's what start means. So your variables need to satisfy these conditions. The second condition, which is, which I'll call end just says that one of y n to the c k is, a, is an accepting state. Right? There's an accept state somewhere in the string over here. Three, which just says, which I'll call is valid says that X, um, well, I think that this would, okay, so we can put this down, although this, this will turn out to be a consequence of all the previous ones itself. I don't think we even, we may not even need this condition. This is just saying that 
uh, for each t only, or I should say exactly one of y t k is a state. And the fourth is move, which just says that uh, y t star, which I mean is the whole configuration, follows from y t minus one star. So for all t. Right, so I've represented the computation in terms of some checks on the symbols. It's just some checking of the symbol. So it's like saying that you gave me some symbols, a matrix of symbols. You gave me a matrix of symbols in sigma union space union Q. And I just need to check whether all of these conditions hold. And this is called the filling of the tableau. I have to start, I have to end, there needs to be a valid, uh, every, each has to, there's, there needs to be only one state and um, there has to be a move, right? A move would say that yt star follows from yt minus one star using the transition functions, using the transition functions. Any questions about this? Any questions about this? Uh, it seems like there's more than just two possible values for Y zero or like Y TK. Yeah, so I have to, uh, let me, let me, I will encode this. You, you're right. So right now you also need to, in, uh, sorry, say that again. Well, I'm saying like why, why at any given point can take on like, I don't know, some constant number of values, but there might be a lot of values. No, so, but think of it as, right now, I'm just thinking of it as, this is a variable. So you give me an explicit symbol for each y. Oh, okay, y sure. So it's like, you're giving me this tableau of variables. But they're, but they're not Boolean variables. They're not Boolean yet. Okay. Yes, exactly. So this sure. is not Boolean. It's actually a variable in a larger alphabet. Sure. But, but you could imagine now I just have to encode all of this in, in, I, if I just encode all of these things appropriately in binary, then I'm done. Yeah. And that's exactly what's going to happen. It's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. So, you know, I guess you could get a Turing award for a result that could be presented within a day, but uh, that was, that was then not anymore. Uh, but yes, I mean, Cook, um, um, I, Cook definitely won the Turing Award for this. I, I think Levin as well, although Levin was on the other side of the Iron Curtain, so I'm not sure, but I, I believe they both won the award. Okay, so does this make sense? So the idea simply is, if you give me this tableau of variables, just like a matrix, think of it as you're given this Ah, someone said Cook didn't get tenure. That's true, but this is actually before he got the Turing Award, not after. But yes, that was uh, um, yes, that was a huge miss by uh, by Berkeley. <clears throat> okay, so here's um, here's this tableau, right? Is n to the c cross n to the c matrix filled up with a bunch of values, and when you just have to check these conditions on those values. But as was pointed out, these values are actually in a larger alphabet, not in binary. So the only business now is to construct the Boolean formula. We have to convert all of this to binaries. So to construct Boolean formula from the tableau, So now we are going to construct a series of Boolean variables. So for all p less than n to the c, for all k less than n to the c, 
and for all symbols alpha in sigma union space union q i'm going to construct the variable now i'm i'm going I, I, let me use a uh, little y for that so little y of t k alpha is supposed to encode one if y tk is equal to alpha and zero otherwise. Right? So this is going to be my Boolean variable. Now I want this Boolean variable to only take, so I have to ensure that for a fixed t and k, only one of y t k alpha, I should say exactly one of y t k alpha is true. So I'm going to just refer to this as, as the unique condition. And you can, you can see that what I, what I do is Firstly, I want one of them to be true. So I'll just say that for, I'm just gonna take the or of all of these. So for or of all of these, uh, uh, y, t, k, alpha. So this has to be true. And I don't want two of them to be true. So I'll just uh, take the and over all alpha and beta symbols, alpha not equal to beta. So one of them has to be false. So this is just saying that, you know, either uh, y t k alpha or y t k beta, right? So this is encoding uniqueness. And then I just do this for all t less than n to the c for all k less than n to the c, right? So if you look at the size of this formula, the size of the formula is at most O of n to the 2c. Right, is at most O of n to the 2c. And so this gives you the fact that once we, once we put this, we know that we are essentially now encoding the tableau. And then we need to write out Boolean formulas for all of these. Start and end are actually quite easy. So is unique. You can use exactly the same logic as before. And so the interesting one typically is move that needs to be encoded. And the way I'm gonna write this down so are there any questions about this? So once you've written down this formula, and note that this formula is just something syntactic that can be written down by an algorithm. An algorithm just goes and writes this formula down. And this formula ensures that we're effectively filling a tableau. Because when this is true, for each t and k, exactly one of these is true, y t k alpha, and that is encoding the fact that capital YTK is equal to alpha, which is encoding the symbol that goes in that position of the tableau. Now, when you think of it, start is fairly easy because you just, you just have to match the symbols here, right? So you have to say that, um, so essentially we know that there is precisely well, maybe maybe I'll write this down just just so that it just so that it is clear. So, so what is start? So the formula of start is simply going to say y zero zero of q zero and y zero one of x one because x remember was the input. X was the input that we're trying to determine if it's an M or not. And so you could just say that X has a bunch of symbols, X1, X2, X3, so on and so forth. And Y0, 2, 
x2 and y0, 3, x3, so on and so forth. So again, you one can just write this down, 0 and to the c of, I guess you just need up to n, technically, um, of xn or, and then and y0, you know, n plus 1, we'll just put a blank and so on and so forth. So this gives us a formula for start. Again, the size of this formula, the size in this case is just actually at most n to the c. Right, so if you put the encodings and everything else together, then you might get a little bit more, but it's all, it's all just polynomials in n to the c. Okay. And so now what we need to do is move. So again, just as I did start, you can assume one can do end, one can do valid. So I'm not going to write all of these things down in, in gory detail. So for move, what we need to do is to simply choose the right transition function. And so let's just, and also observe the following. So how does one implement a move? So look at this. to blow and look at two adjacent rows. Now take any block, three cross two block. So this is looking at two configurations. This is a three cross two block. Now what you know is if there is no state symbol over here, if there is no state symbol in these three, then that symbol cannot change. Because the only way that something can change is if the head is pointing to it. So if the head is over here, then the only thing that, that could happen is that the head could write this symbol and then move left or right, which does not change this symbol here. If the head was here, it could potentially make a change here. But if the head was anywhere over here, it only points to the next symbol. And so any change will not affect this uh, cell. Does this make sense? So for move, there are a series of conditions that I need to write. And I'm going to write these conditions down sort of in English, but then again, you could encode all of these through binary using that representation, using this sort of symbolism here. Okay, because now YTK is going to represent some symbol that's there in a particular cell, and we've encoded that to be unique. We mean that we've encoded that capital YTK is going to be one specific symbol. So for move, we can write down essentially we, you know, we write down a bunch of conditions. So first we'll say that for all t less than n to the c, k less than n to the c, that if y tk minus 1, y tk, and y tk plus 1 are all not state symbols, then uh, I'm sorry, y of t plus 1k is equal to y of tk, which means under this condition, those Boolean, the Boolean versions are all just going to be identical. They're all going to be identical. Now, the interesting case is when one of these is a state symbol, then we have to decide, we have to decide what's going to happen. <clears throat> and so the way to encode, uh, to encode that is now let's go back to the transition function. Let's go, uh, so note that we can think of the transition function 
you know, has some, it has some set of transitions. So we can create a new Boolean variable. I'm going to write this Boolean variable as Z T I, which is simply saying that, so again, you know, one, um, you know, one does this sort of, you know, painfully, but one can think of, I can list, I can think of delta as a table. where I have Q, sigma, and then the various options, Q, sigma. So this I think of as the input, and this is the output, Q, sigma. I can think of rule one, rule two, rule. So I, I could imagine writing down all the transitions as rules. And ZTI would simply be that it's one if the ith rule is used in the tth step and zero else. And again, I can ensure that um, for all t, there exists a unique i such that z t i is equal to one. So in each step, there is a unique rule that will be used. Now, using the choice of that rule, I can then encode what the next symbols are going to be. So now when I do the move step, what I would say is, well, if one of these is a state, then, you know, set all the others appropriately. So the move would simply be something like what you would do is, um, so I'm going to write this down and then we'll, you, you, you'll see what I mean. Uh, so for all T less than N to the C for all I, this is at most, you know, the, the size of the transition table. Z, T, I implies. So this is, I'm writing down a Boolean formula here. So this is like saying that the, the ith rule chosen in the tth step. Right. If this is the case, this implies, then we'll say that, you know, uh, the and of k going all the way to n to the c. So I'm going to write something in English, and then we can we can verify it. Um, I mean, okay. So maybe I should, I should. Yeah. Essentially, what this means is I'll write something here, and then you can you can see what's going on. So you'll see that I can say that why T K Y T sorry K minus one K and Y T K plus one determine Y T plus one of K. Right again, this is this picture here. It says if you have two neighboring configurations and you're looking at y t plus one k, then these three symbols, whatever they are, completely determine what happens here. So if these three symbols are not state symbols, then y t plus one k is equal to y t k. If one of these is a state symbol, so let's say maybe this is a state symbol, then depending on the transition rule, you'll see what change happens. And if this is a state symbol, then it probably writes something over here and the head moves 
And depending on the move, that depends, that affects what's written here. So this determination happens from, this determining is through the ith rule of the transition table. So naturally, if one has to do this sort of in all gory detail, one ends up with, you know, there's there, there, basically there are lots of details to be worked out, but it's not worth me writing down all of these things. But note that as you do this, you get all of these Boolean formulas, one for each cell of the tableau. So overall, overall, we can write down in polynomial time, in polynomial time, and write down a Boolean formula of size O of n to the 2c that encodes the tableau. And so if you call this Boolean formula phi of x, then x is in m if and only if phi of x is satisfiable. Right? And this basically, I mean, I've sort of sketched, sketched out the proof here, but you can see that because it's encoding the entire behavior of the tableau, x is in m if and only if phi of x is satisfiable. And indeed, that is the proof of the Cook-Levin theorem, or at least sketched out mostly. And so what this proves is that SAT is NP-complete. Okay, so this shows that SAT is NP-complete. Okay, so I've kind of gone through those, gone through the last details a bit quickly, but hopefully you kind of, you understand that it's basically just some sort of syntactic calculations that need to be done to write down each of these formulas. Okay, so this is a good point to end. So let's end the lecture here. I'm happy to take any questions that you have about NP-completeness or the Cook-Levin theorem.